Okay, hello everyone. It's great to be here in Korea at STO Summit. I to thank everyone for inviting me to speak about Infinite Fleet. So, a brief uh, intro to Infinite Fleet first. Infinite Fleet is an MMO strategy game. It is a PVE experience currently, so you as a player will come in and start playing against an alien faction. And um, the human faction is called the USF, United Soul Federation, and the aliens are called Aatrox. So this is a game, first and foremost. So a bit about myself. My name is Samson. I'm the CEO of Pixelmatic. Pixelmatic is the development studio behind Infinite Fleet. Exordium is the publishing entity. I'm also the CEO of Jan3, which is a Bitcoin technology company that is focused on accelerating Bitcoin adoption around the world. I'm also the, known as the architect of the Bitcoin bonds. These are Bitcoin-backed uh, bonds that I designed well at Blockstream, a Bitcoin infrastructure company, and I'll speak more to that later. And before this, I was the COO at BTC China. This was one of the largest exchanges and mining pools back in the day. Um, and before that, I was the director of production at Ubisoft, working on games um, like Might and Magic and others. I also worked on a number of uh, AAA real-time strategy games. One of them is called Company of Heroes. This was one of the highest rated RTS games of all time. And it's, it was a very revolutionary game because it was uh, squad-based combat set in destructible environments. So by destroying the environment or changing the environment, you can actually change gameplay. Uh, another RTS title I worked on was called Dawn of War. This is a sci-fi game based off of the Warhammer 40K license. And this is also a series. So there's Dawn of War 1, 2, and 3, and some spin-offs. And then at Ubisoft, I worked on Might and Magic Heroes Kingdoms, which is a, game, a web game set in the Heroes of Might and Magic franchise. So this is similar to games like Kingdoms of Camelot or similar uh, 4X type games where you're commanding armies and conquering territory. So Infinite Fleet, we tried very hard to set it apart from similar games, but if you had to compare, we're somewhere along the lines of uh, EVE Online or Star Citizen, but we sought to really distinguish ourselves from the pack. So one of the key things is we have a directed narrative, and this is where players become a part of the story in the game. We also have a procedurally generated universe so that players can explore a vast amount of space, planets, and such. And also, digital assets are a key pillar of Infinite Fleet. We wanted players to have their own digital assets. And this is going to be a large part of this presentation, talking about that. Also, I'm a big sci-fi fan myself, so we designed it so every ship in the game transforms so that uh, you can have a big robot mechs. It's fleet-based combat, so similar to squads in Dawn of War and Company of Heroes, you're not commanding one ship like other games like EVE and Star Citizen, but you're commanding a fleet of ships. So it's sort of squad-based combat in space. We have a very interesting soundtrack as well. And another key focus of ours is that we want it to be hard science fiction. So what this means is we tried as much as possible to not create fantasy sci-fi things. So as an example in the game, the baseline of energy technology is nuclear fusion, because I think fusion itself is magical enough. It's basically energy from nothing. So we try to keep everything very much grounded in science as much as possible, but of course we do need to deviate from time to time to create things like warp, warp travel. So more on directed narrative. In Infinite Fleet, the players have the opportunity to effectively become a part of the story. And I believe this is a shortcoming for most games, MMO games in particular. So the game development process largely kicks off and then you build all the quests, all the missions, everything a player does, and then they play through the game and consume all of that content. And when that's done, they just replay that content again. And the game developer is rushing to create more content, which is released as expansion packs. A good example of that could be World of Warcraft. So you have, have expansion after expansion, content is exhausted and replenished, but by and large, the content is used up. So directed narrative is our approach to make this game more like an intimate Dungeons and Dragons game where you're playing with a dungeon master that's crafting 
the whole experience for you as a player. So the game itself is laid out in terms of large scale objectives and the players get to choose what they pursue. So they can go on certain missions which will unlock other progression steps in the story or they can not. And how the game advances and what evolves from the game is largely based on the players. And as they do this, we write them into the story, into the lore of the story. So if you play a normal MMO game like World of Warcraft or even Lineage 2, I was a big Lineage 2 player, that's a Korean game. But when you're done with the game, you're done with the game and there's nothing else to do. And all of your accomplishments, achievements are lost. So by creating this direct narrative, we hope to recapture that. So at least you'll have the story. It'll be published digitally online, but we can also publish it in the form of books down the road. So you can capture all of your achievements in a physical book and pass that on to your children if you wanted to. So these are some examples of us starting with the directed narrative. So the game is currently in closed beta still. It's open for registration, but we call it closed because we reserve the right to stop registrations because a service might get overloaded. But these are the first two. So we have some rebel hunting events where players can go and we tell them to eradicate a rebel faction somewhere. And the bigger one that we did recently to try out the directed narrative was called the Balder Initiative. So this was a four-part four campaign lasting nearly a month. And players had to defend this research station um, from Aatrox attack. And unfortunately, the players were not able to fend off the attacks in time. So the station is destroyed permanently until we issue another quest where maybe they can reconstruct the station. But they did manage to complete the objective of rescuing the, the NPC players inside the station and this new prototype ship called the Prospector which allows them to enhance their mining operations. And this is a limited edition ship that's only granted to those that participated in this Balder initiative. So you can see, you can play the game, affect change in the world of the game, and unlock new things. And this is something we want to do for upgrades, new equipment, new items. It's all meant to be player driven, and us as developers working in tandem with the players to unfold the entire story that we have planned. So I'll just show some screenshots of various parts of the game. This is a, a Versa. Uh, much like any MMO, you have ship progression. You upgrade the ships, which upgrade your commander level, which unlocks new content. You have basic MMO stuff like equipment that can be fabricated, enhanced, and by enhancement, it can become unique. And these things we hope to transform into digital assets as well so that they can be traded. Uh, we have different abilities that can be upgraded over time. Every ship has its own unique ability. So if you think of ships as a, a League of Legends character, you have different classes of ships that do different things. Either they're ranged attackers or tanks or um, healers or such. This is some of the concept art. This is a Versa along with a, a several fleets of other Versa ships in ship mode. But you can see ships transform as well as mechs that can be launched from ships. More concept art, some ships hanging out over a planet. This is a, a carrier. This is a specialized ship designed to carry other mechs into combat. So you can load it out with um, different types of mechs that will perform different types of attacks on the enemy. And this is the soundtrack. We haven't announced it yet, but we've been working with a number of artists that uh, make up the Transformer soundtrack from 1986. I'm a big fan of Transformers as well. So we managed to get several of the composers from the Transformers. And the ambient soundtracks for Infinite Fleet are done by Vince DiCola, who also did Rocky, uh, and myself. We created different themed tracks for different stars. So when you visit different stars in Infinite Fleet, the music changes. And the combat music is done by the heavy metal bands that worked on this soundtrack. So a lot of things are still coming. The game is still in development. We have procedural generation as the next big feature. So where players have uh, hundreds of millions of POIs, we call these points of interest. So stars, planets, moons, etc. Right now it's all handmade, but this new update will expand the game exponentially. Uh, we have more progression systems. We have a peer-to-peer -peer NFT marketplace where people will be able to trade their ships and in the future other items and they'll be able to finally earn the INF token. Right now, it's 
not yet earnable. So some stats on Infinite Fleet. In our STO, we've raised 7.9 publicly. This is between our seed and Series A, uh, part one of Series A. Part two, we haven't announced yet, but there's additional funding that we've raised. We've sold about 6,500 ships. And again, these ships are just in-game digital assets, but they're not NFTs yet. We haven't tokenized them. We had one auction of a one-of-one one ship, a unique ship that no one else can have, and that sold for 10,000. And throughout, close, throughout alpha and closed beta, we've generated about 500,000 in revenue, and our community is about 2,000 strong. So these are just uh, in-game screenshots of gameplay. You can see you can control. Right now, this person has three ships in their fleet. You can have a maximum of five. Um, you can fly around asteroid fields, mine, hunt enemies. This is another piece of combat. You can see um, some weapons fire, some mechs flying around. Those are the trails from the mechs. And this is a larger operation of probably three or four players playing together, so each player with their five ships. And this is an example of long-range artillery. This is the, um, the cannon ship that's blasting from afar as you close distance. These are some of the space stations in Infinite Fleet. They're quite large megastructures. And this is a, another station. So there's different factions in the game, five human factions and one alien faction. Uh, you can see in the background there, this is some of our planet tech. So we're able to generate very realistic planets uh, in terms of terrain, geography, um, water, like oceans and rivers, as well as atmosphere. And this is the, one of the core parts of the procedural generation or progen system that we're rolling out. So you'll have very unique looking planets that populate the entire galaxy. This is a screenshot from the marketplace. So once we launch this, you can trade your INF currency for these NFT ships that you own and level up. So the game is broken up into two tokens. We like to call it a dual token model. The INF token is the currency of the players, re which represents players' time. And the EXO token is the STO, the security token that we've sold in our offerings. The, there is a clear delineation between the two. We didn't want to uh, confuse the two things. So INF is never sold, it's earned. Just like if you play World of Warcraft or Lineage 2, you'll earn the gold, the currency. So this is a key distinction that we have, I think, from other games that are issuing NFTs and dig digital assets. We want to make sure that um, most of the digital assets are not sold. The ships are sold, but those are sold at you know, level one. So the players level them up, and they're, they're completely up to them to imbue the ships with value. Whereas INF token and other digital assets in the game, like items, those are just earned by players. The EXO token is a security token. And you can see this uh, feeds into a loop. So you have proof of participation where you play the game, earn the game currency, and then you can trade it on the peer to peer marketplace for the digital assets. So it all works together. And I think this delivers a superior user experience for uh, players of these MMO games. The key here is that we want everything to be a bearer asset. And this ties into the security token portion as well. So, by bearer asset, I mean if you have the asset, it is in your possession and in your control, and it's effectively ownership. And this is an improvement for games because the ownership doesn't end because you quit the game. You can still keep the token representing your items, and the players hold the power. So right now, most games, if you are banned from the game, you'll lose all of your items. And as a game operator, developer, we have terms of service, so if those things are violated for certain reasons, we would have to ban a player. But in Infinite Fleet, you'll still have all of your assets. So you technically could create a new account or sell those to someone else, and you don't have that binding of your assets with the player account. And there is an interesting anecdote here from Roblox. So I played with Roblox recently, and I was able to purchase a lot of their digital items, but it was not clear that you had to bind your user ID to an email. And then they did some server reboot or reset, and that caused my account to be logged out. And unfortunately, because I didn't bind it to an email, I had no way to claim back all of the digital assets. And all the IAPs I made were effectively lost. And I went, I went to support, and I went through several tiers of support, 
and they just said, sorry, you're out of luck. There's nothing we can do to give you your items back. Even though I had the records of the iTunes purchases and everything, I had lost all of my digital assets. And I think this is a problem that we've solved in digital, Infinite Fleet with digital assets because now they go to your wallet and you're in, they're in your own possession. Another thing is we've embraced the concept of secondary markets. So in all MMO games that have items and currencies, secondary markets do evolve. Uh, EVE Online, Diablo, World of Warcraft, and so forth. And some game companies, a lot of them actually fight against the secondary markets. And when I was first developing Infinite Fleet, some of our design team also argued against the ability to have secondary markets. Because if you think about it, if you can only sell new cars and it's you're not allowed to buy used cars, then people will only buy the new cars. Um, there won't be any cannibalization of new car sales. But we know that that's not the case in the real world, and it's also not the case in games as well. Players will always find a way to circumvent any controls that you have and create secondary markets. So as an example, you can't sell gold in World of Warcraft. So what did players do? They simply started selling empty accounts with gold in them. So there's always a way. Players are very creative. So we decided to embrace it, and by tokenizing our game assets, we can make a safer environment that fosters trade. So players can use atomic swaps for our digital assets, and that means that they can either trade it all at once or it doesn't happen at all. So there's no more scams where your seller says, send me the money first on PayPal, and I'll send you the assets later. So now on to the STO portion. Um, the EXO token, our intention here was that we wanted the players to be investors in the game. So Exordium is the publishing entity, and the token is called EXO. And we wanted to let the players have a stake, because for MMO games, players often invest hundreds of hours, even years of their lives playing these games and building out um, characters or guilds or in some games like EVE Online, superstructures. So we wanted them to also be able to invest in the game as well and benefit should the game earn a profit. So we split the EXO token into two parts. The US portion is only for US investors, EXO US, and this is done through a Reg D offering. So we could potentially list it on security token exchanges. We haven't done that yet, but we're looking at INX as one of those options for the US. The EU portion is done through Stoker, and I'll introduce them a bit more in, a, in later parts of my talk. But this is meant for EU and rest of the world. So we have investors from many places, not just the EU, that invest in the EU token. But both of them have the same, both tokens have the same value and the same profit share which is 20%. So in EXO US, we've raised about 3 million, and EXO EU, about 4.9 million. And the important thing here is that these two tokens are interchangeable. So we've had some investors want to migrate uh, their US token holdings to the EU, and all we do is we invalidate their US token, and we issue on the EU side. So it's movable between both marketplaces. We've also, had play, uh, we've also had investors lose their tokens as well, and we've had to uh, reissue, but that was a very straightforward process as well because security tokens obviously are centralized. They're issued by an issuer, and they can be reclaimed if you provide documentation uh, and so forth. So what are the benefits of equity tokenization? I think there are a number of benefits, and it largely has to do, again, with that bearer element of these digital assets. So I believe a lot of the STOs in Korea are not bearer assets. They're tokenized, but they're not held in self-custody and in uh, investors' own wallets. But I think being a bearer asset is an important part of this whole process, because if you think of Bitcoin, I'm a big Bitcoin maximalist and proponent, is the restoration of money, where we restore key properties of money that have been degraded over time, such as portability and fungibility. And this is the same thing with security tokens. You're restoring bearer shares, which was the original form of equity. You have a paper, and if you have the paper, it is your share. If you don't have the paper, 
it's not yours and it's gone. But this is a key part because you can see a lot of the problems in the financial system right now stem from the lack of this bare asset, bare asset element. You can have naked short selling, uh, you have degradation in terms of um, trading time. If you take Bitcoin as an example, Bitcoin is 15 years old, but it has over 80 years of trading history because Bitcoin trading is 24-7, 365. So I don't think there is a valid reason why security should not be trading at that same standard anymore in this modern day and age. And I think tokenization is a key part of that. The other important part of equity tokenization is that bearer aspect. So for example, the EXO token, as well as other assets issued on the Liquid Network, these can be traded peer-to-peer -peer as well in a, a wallet called Sideswap. And it can be done from a hardware wallet, so a physical device where you store your assets, uh, much like Bitcoin. But this is done peer-to-peer, -peer, so I can create an offering that is traded and swapped atomically for these security tokens. And that's done because, that's doable because there is a whitelist still that is managed by the issuer. So anybody that's on that whitelist that is wanting to trade it can trade on this peer-to-peer -peer marketplace at any time. But given all these benefits, I still think there are challenges to STOs and tokenization. Um, I hope that the market will move more towards the bearer aspect side. And I think there is room to grow, especially in Korea, for all these different security issuances. But there is a more fundamental issue as well. So I want to talk about the challenges for STOs. Having done an STO offering myself, it is very difficult because it's sitting just between an ICO and something like an IPO. So if, if you're not familiar, an ICO is an initial coin offering. And this is a, a crypto term that is trying to mirror IPOs. They're trying to, um, I guess, affinity scam and say it's like a initial public offering. That's why it's called an ICO, initial coin offering. Initial coin offerings are largely a very wild west phenomenon. You take investments from basically anybody. Um, there are no capital protections, no, no protections for investors whatsoever. And it's very easy to launch these things because you simply post the offering up and start collecting money. So it's a very low barrier to entry to do an ICO. And in theory, they are securities. And even projects like Ethereum likely should be deemed a security, even though the SEC recently deemed it not to be. But it's, it checks all the boxes for securities and the same for most ICOs. But the problem is the enforcement is not even across the board. So most of these projects have very little downside and little penalties other than reputational risk and of course risk for investors. So on the other side of that, you have traditional securities offerings like IPOs, which are very costly, cumbersome, and it, you automatically have a limited pool of investors because you need to KYC and go through all of the jumps and hoops to onboard people into this type of offering. So you don't have the ease of launch. You don't have the ease of access to all this capital out there floating around that seeks great returns. And most STO projects need to be a real project. ICO projects, they always launch and then they dump on their investors and they disappear. So there's no responsibility to deliver as well. But with STO projects, they need to be likely a real world thing that has some hope of uh, generating revenue and ROI down the road. So this is what I think is the largest hurdle, that it is more challenging, less profitable, and harder to launch. So how do we get around that? So I've been thinking about this a lot since my time at Blockstream. And this is when I fortuitously was introduced to the government of El Salvador when they were interested to launch their Bitcoin strategy. So for those that don't know, El Salvador uh, made Bitcoin legal tender as part of a very comprehensive Bitcoin strategy to reboot their, their entire country and their economy, first and foremost. So I pitched them the idea of creating um, Bitcoin bonds. This was originally just a, a joke on Twitter, uh, X at the time. 
but um, people were saying that you have volcanoes and you have all this energy, you should just mine Bitcoin. And then people started talking about creating Bitcoin bonds. So I had this interesting opportunity and I created a presentation and a rough design for what a uh, Bitcoin bond could look like. And they were interested as well because I think President Bukele wanted to transform El Salvador into the, the Singapore of Latin America. And to be the Singapore of Latin America, what that means is you have to have financial markets. And it's not good enough to just launch a similar thing like a stock exchange. You have to leapfrog and do something much bolder, more advanced, and deliver some tangible benefits to draw that capital and create this new marketplace. So the Bitcoin bonds, it, it's effectively tokenized sovereign debt. It's an STO. And I believe the key to overcome the inertia to launch the security token market mainstream is you need bigger offerings, something massive. And there's nothing more massive out there than sovereign debt. This is in the hundreds of trillions of dollars range. And if we can combine that with Bitcoin, then I think it changes the entire paradigm. And it could be the, boot, the booting up of a real security token market. Because the challenge right now you face is low liquidity, the venues are few and far between, and there is not enough money being added to this marketplace. So if you're raising capital, it is not easy to raise. And plus, people still don't want to hold these bearer assets. So for Infinite Fleet, later on, we had to carve out a separate class of uh, shares that were just for investors, because many investors didn't want to hold onto that security token. But I think something like this could change the entire game. So the Bitcoin bonds was planned to be a $1 billion raise, with 500 million going towards purchasing Bitcoin, and 500 million going into a productive activity, which was supposed to be mining. And uh, this was announced in 2021, and I believe it's going to come soon, but it is behind schedule. And I think it, it, it will be a big impact when it finally comes out. But uh, this is the start of something big. It is tokenized sovereign debt. And it is a way for countries, nation states, to have their own microstrategy playbook. So if you distill down what microstrategy is at the core, it is simply using corporate debt to buy Bitcoin. And that's done wonders for their stock. They've outperformed S&P index. They've out even outperformed NVIDIA. And that is simply by buying and holding Bitcoin. And countries can do the same. But what does this offer to investors? This offers investors a superior return on their fiat investments. So you would invest dollars and you'll earn outsized returns and interest, basically, uh, the, the, the payments from the bonds on dollars. So it could potentially be 100% yield or even more, depending on the price appreciation of the Bitcoin held in this Bitcoin bond structure, which would be shared with investors. So Stoker is the company that we worked with at uh, Infinite Fleet to launch our XOEU token. They've done a number of issuances with other companies. Uh, Blockstream is one of them. Blockstream has a mining note, Blockstream mining note. And that was also a very interesting thing. So all of these things eventually will be anchored to Bitcoin to generate outsized returns. So the Blockstream mining note, in terms of fiat money, if you invested euros, you made a 56% return over a three-year period. But the interesting thing was because the Blockstream mining note is actually mining Bitcoin, and this, the securitization structure of the Blockstream mining note, or BMN, was you have a direct claim on to the Bitcoin mined. You could also invest Bitcoin and get Bitcoin back. But this also was really interesting because it performed um, at 32% return. So you actually could invest one Bitcoin and get 32% more Bitcoin from this instrument. So you can see like Bitcoin supercharges all of these things. And I think there is a strong connectivity there between STOs and Bitcoin, or at least there should be. So this is just some of the stuff that Stoker does. Um, they helped us with the structure, the tokenization support, compliance, onboarding, documentation, and listing. And it was interesting, I think, for both of us to launch this STO because before us, I think they had 
you know, not that many users on their platform. And because Infinite Fleet is a, a very retail project, it is a game with players, we ended up driving several thousand people to their platform to invest because the investment threshold we set was very low, I think um, $1,000 or even less than that. So it was a very democratizing thing where players could invest a little bit of money into um, a game and potentially see an ROI on that investment. So the underlying technology is called Blockstream AMP. This is the asset management protocol. So this sits on top of the liquid network, which I'll talk about next. But um, this manages the, the tokens, the STO tokens that are issued. So there is a whitelist that is part of this protocol. And the whitelist is updatable. But the difference here between most other, I guess, security token tokenization methods is that we accept that um, security are centralized. So you don't need a decentralized blockchain to launch these things because the security token is issued by a company which is also centralized. And you should be able to reclaim lost tokens if you lose them, provided you can identify yourself accordingly. So there's no need to have um, some smart contract done which can whitelist investors. And in fact, this was a key point that drove Stoker to first reach out to us at Blockstream to work together because they had built at first on Ethereum. And Ethereum gas fees meant that they were paying sometimes $100 to whitelist a new investor. And that's just not feasible, especially if the investor was investing $100. So it does not change the formula much when it's such an expensive method to invest that you have to have a very high minimum to make it even make sense at all. So, AMP sort of resolves that. It is a, a centralized service because it's a centralized company issuing a centralized security, and we accepted that trade-off. The underlying tech, though, is the Liquid Network, which is a Bitcoin sidechain. And this is another key part. We didn't want to issue securities on what could be deemed a security itself down the road. So you can see the SEC in the US was announcing that many altcoin projects, cryptocurrency projects, are probably securities and they're going after them. And I don't think it is practical, at least in my conservative view, to issue a security on top of another security. So this is why we chose the Liquid Network as the basis, because Liquid is simply a Bitcoin sidechain. There was no ICO. The token in Liquid Bitcoin is Bitcoin that is locked in the network. So there is no risk of it being deemed a security. So Blockstream AMP and Liquid work together in tandem to, do, to, to facilitate these new financial instruments. Um, and I think the uh, Bitcoin bonds of El Salvador will also be using this tech stack as well. But if this takes off, I think we can see more countries issuing tokenized debt as securities. So it could be the start of something big. And we, at Gen3, my Bitcoin company, we are actively working on engaging with more countries to do these Bitcoin bonds. So this is just a diagram showing how Liquid works. It's a sidechain, so it's anchored to Bitcoin. Uh, there's a two-way peg in which you lock up Bitcoin and unlock it in the sidechain. So it's always a one-to-one -one ratio. And it, Liquid has different properties. It takes, it's, it's faster, it's one minute block times. You have confidential transactions. And it's just, um, more reliable, so it's uh, one minute every block, whereas with Bitcoin Network, it's roughly 10 minutes, but not necessarily 10 minutes. And fees can spike on the Bitcoin main chain, whereas on Liquid, they're far more stable. So it was a very practical way for us to work and issue these securities. So you have fast final settlement, confidential transactions, secure tokenization, and one integration with many assets, and you can perform atomic swaps for these security tokens with other assets like LPTC or stable coins like Tether in the network, or even other security. So you can have this trustless swap mechanism in one ecosystem. So Liquid provides this financial infrastructure layer on top of Bitcoin, and it is an open network, so anybody can issue an asset in Liquid. And if you choose not to use Blockstream AMP as the issuing protocol, you could technically build your own and launch that on top of Liquid as well. So it's a very elegant solution. So this is uh, largely my presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. 
And uh, I guess the key takeaways is that STOs are poised to be a revolutionary new avenue for capital formation and for trading and for just how people hold their own assets. But there are roadblocks and challenges. But I think something like a Bitcoin bond or tokenized sovereign debt is the push that's needed to launch this into the mainstream. Thank you very much.